Earlier today, a highly respected member of the crypto community released details on how their digital wallet was compromised and around $3 million in assets were stolen. The hack involved a targeted social engineering attack combined with a sophisticated payload hidden within a malicious document. This wasn't a newbie, it happened to someone that was technically minded, a crypto native, and it should act as a wake up call to anyone that thinks they're too smart to get hacked. So let's look at some common attack vectors and tips to prevent crypto phishing attacks. The most common way that digital wallets get hacked is through the sharing of a seed phrase. What is something that people working in crypto should know about already? It's worth having a conversation, especially if you've got friends that get into NFTs or DeFi for the first time, because it actually happens a lot. When you set up a new digital wallet, it will generally ask you to write down your seed phrase on a bit of paper and store that somewhere safe to, as a backup to your account. The only time you should ever need that is if you lose access to your account. There's no legitimate reason ever to share that with a third party online. The next thing to be aware of is fake Google Ads. This is where an attacker will place an advertisement at the very top of the search results, which will lead you off to a clone of a familiar website, which has some malicious intent. In this example, we're looking at the decentralized exchange Spirit Swap, which this top ad will lead you off to a clone of Spirit Swap, which looks exactly the same for all intents and purposes. When you try to connect to your wallet, it will pop up a fake MetaMask box, and that'll ask you for your seed phrase. Obviously, if you put your seed phrase in, it will send that off to the attackers and they'll drain the funds from your wallet. This is definitely something that shouldn't be happening and Google should be doing more to remove these malicious advertisers and make it easier for people to report. Another really common attack vector is phishing emails. These are fake emails that get sent out to look like they come from an exchange or a website that you're already using. It will tell you that you need to verify your account or you've been banned. You need to do something to kind of get your account access back or you're gonna lose funds. And they're trying to get you to like take action by sending you through to a fake website via a link. If you click through to the website, it will have some kind of malicious intent, like it will try and steal your login details and they'll send them to the attacker. As a general rule of thumb, the best practice is just to never click links in emails. You can almost always take the same action by visiting the website via the browser or bookmarking the browser and then going through to whatever action you want it to take place, whatever it's prompting you to do. If your account's been banned and it will give you a notification of that once you log into your account, don't click on the link to go through to your account from the email. This next one's really scary and it's how Alpha Zero X got hacked. It was a executable file hidden within a Microsoft Word document, a .docx file. It had a macro in it or something that was executing on its computer, which then downloaded a Trojan. Once the Trojan is installed, the attacker has complete control of the computer. I was reading some research about this from a security company, which I've linked to in my blog post, which actually mentioned that even ledger hardware wallets aren't, are kind of susceptible to this attack because they've seen cases where the attacker has intercepted transactions before they've gone to send to the ledger wallet. Then that's kind of, that transaction has been modified. It's then been signed by the ledger wallet. And then that's been posted back with the, so the, the attacker's transaction has been signed rather than the user's intended transaction. So if you think you're safe because you're using a hardware wallet in cold storage, as soon as you connect that up to a internet connected device, if that machine is compromised, then you're vulnerable still. It doesn't offer you 100% protection. And that's something to be really aware of. In the case that we spoke about, this was a very targeted attack. It came from a trusted source. The executable was delivered by a company that they were already working with, someone that they were familiar with. So they had no reason to believe that it was a malicious document. So it really shows just how careful you have to be to prevent this kind of spear phishing attack. If you're watching this video and you want to take action right now, then what a great time to review your password security. There's a few things here. Obviously don't use the same password for everything or a variation of the same password for everything. Two, make sure you protect your primary email account and any other kind of critical accounts that might hold funds. If someone has access to your primary email account, they can normally reset passwords to other accounts than your name. If you haven't changed your password for a number of years, then it's probably worth changing. And if you can use a password manager, then all the better. Also set up two-factor authentication wherever possible. Don't use SMS two-factor authentication, but use like an app like Google Authenticator or Allfi. This will provide you with a next, another step of protection against some, if, if your accounts are compromised or someone finds out your password. The next tip is to beware of direct messages or DMs. If you've ever used Telegram, you've probably come across scammers and impersonators who will pretend to be someone else. 
they'll change their username by one letter and use the same profile picture and they'll contact you saying they've got this amazing opportunity and you just need to send 10 ETH to this address. And it's just scammers and like they don't, they do it because they catch people out. So just be wary of that. And again, well, 99% of it is easy to spot. The more targeted and sophisticated these attacks become, the harder it is to distinguish it from real correspondence. One really good practice is to always verify the root domain of the website that you're visiting. If you're doing something on Coinbase, for example, the root domain should always be coinbase.com. If somehow you ended up at a link which sends you to coinbase-authenticator.com, then the likelihood is that that's a fake website which has been set up by a scammer. There's no reason that Coinbase wouldn't create something within their own domain. Browsers have become better at highlighting the root domain. This is always the last bit of the domain name. So authentication.coinbase.com, that's a subdomain of coinbase.com, that's fine. Whereas coinbaseauthenticator.com is a different domain and anyone can register that and set up a fake website. The final thing that I want to talk about is the use of multiple wallets. We've spoken about hardware wallets and ledgers and some of their shortfallings and how it doesn't offer you complete protection, but I still think they are very valuable. Having your funds on an air gap device which isn't connected to the internet does provide some protection. The other thing that it forces you to do is to have multiple wallets. So you're using something else for your day-to-day -day kind of interaction with DeFi and NFT protocols. You can also do this with different browsers. So you can have different versions of MetaMask set up on different browsers. And I use this a lot when I'm testing out different DeFi protocols and making videos. I have a separate account, which I almost expect to get hacked at some point. And it never has any more than like $50 worth of funds in. I just move that around and test different things out, kind of try them out before I kind of commit any major funds. By separating our digital assets into high risk and low risk accounts, it reduces the risk of us losing all our funds when we go to a new project, which is actually like a rug pull and they've got some kind of malicious contract there, which approves the spend of all of the, the, the digital assets in your wallet to go as soon as you click a button. Because of some of the complexity and the obfuscation when signing smart contract functions, it can actually be really hard to detect what that function is doing in the background. So by having separate wallets, it limits your losses to whatever is in that kind of test account. I hope you found this video useful. For me, it was a worthwhile review of good security practices. If you're interested in learning more about DeFi and digital assets, then consider subscribing to the channel. Please hit the like button for the YouTube algorithm, and thank you for watching.